Uh, I mentioned in the course of the talk last night Sharon Ferguson, who uh, works at Breda Centre, and uh, I work there uh, about three mornings a week, and I mentioned that Sharon was a former Mormon. Uh, I'm glad to say that Sharon is here tonight. She'll be helping on the bookstall. So if you have any questions as a result of last night, don't give them to me. Go to Sharon. She's the expert. She's been there, seen it, and done it. So if there is anything on Mormonism, feel free to ask uh, Sharon. Now we're going to look at the subject of the New Age movement. Uh, unlike last night, Mormonism is a well-organized, well-structured organization, disciplined. The New Age movement is a very loose term. Uh, you can look the yellow pages up and find the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you can ring them up and say, could you send me out details of what you believe? But you can't do that for the New Age movement. It's really an umbrella term used to try and describe a lot of philosophies and spiritual views that are floating about in the world today. What I hope to do <clears throat> is pull them together and give you some means of identifying what's at the heart of these philosophies and help you identify some of the groups and individuals that would constitute what is the New Age movement. I want to read some passages of scripture to give us a backdrop. Uh, I want to read first of all from Genesis chapter 3 uh, and the first five verses uh, of this chapter. I come out without my reading glasses so I'm just sort of focusing at the moment uh, so we'll see how we get on here. So Genesis chapter 3 and beginning to read at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And then if we go over to the New Testament, to Paul's letter to the Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, and we'll begin to read at verse 8 of Colossians chapter 2. Paul issues this warning to the believers, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And then I'm just going to read a couple of verses. You don't need to turn to them from the opening chapter of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I'll begin at verse 8. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. And we do pray that God will bless his word as we consider this topic tonight. Now, the New Age movement, I want to begin by posing some questions uh, but you'll be glad to know that as I pose these questions, I'm going to answer them as well, so relax. Uh, the first question that I might ask you is, where does this title, New Age, come from? Well, it comes from astrology. The people who believe that the stars and the planets govern and guide our destiny and that of planet Earth. These people believe that the planet is influenced by the different star constellations. They believe, in fact, that uh, the Earth is uh, governed, if you like, for roughly 2,000 years by one constellation, and then that constellation moves out of the scene, and another star constellation comes in to take over. There was a program on Sunday night, Every Man, uh, which was looking at astrology, and I'll probably show you a little clip of video from it. Uh, but in that, they re-echoed uh, thoughts that were put together by Carl Gustav Jung, who was a philosopher in the last century, who was into the occult in a big way, and he actually drew up a sort of astrological time scale, and he tried to link it into the scriptures. <clears throat> he said that about 4,000 years before Christ began the age of Taurus, the bull, and he said it sort of was because this was when the children of Israel made the golden calf. That was the biblical basis for the age of Taurus. He then said that about 2,000 years before Christ, 
they moved out of the age of Taurus and you came into the age of Aries, the age of the ram. And that was to link in with uh, Abraham taking Isaac to Mount Moriah to offer him as a sacrifice. And of course, God then intervened and provided the ram caught in the thicket. So that was the start of the age of Aries. Then at the time of Christ, Aries went out of the scene and Pisces came in. This has been the age of Pisces since the birth of Christ. And of course, the sign of Pisces is the sign of the fish. And that was the uh, sign that the early believers used to sort of communicate with each other when it was dangerous to be known as a Christian. They would use the sign of the fish with the Greek word ichthos in the middle. And so that is when the age of Pisces began. But the New Agers and Carl Gustav Jung now tell us that uh, predicted that this age would end around about now and that Pisces would get out of the scene and a new age would come. <clears throat> when I was a teenager just a few years ago, uh, there was a, a musical in the West End of London, a rather infamous musical called Hair. And uh, one of the songs which became very popular from that show was, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And this is what the New Agers and the astrologers will tell us, that we're moving out of the age of Pisces and we're coming on to the age of Aquarius. And again, they claim to have a biblical basis for it. They claim that when the Lord was making arrangements for the Last Supper, he sent the disciples into Jerusalem and he told them, follow a man carrying a pitcher of water. And of course, the sign of, air, of Aquarius is a man carrying a pitcher of water. And they say Christ was predicting what would follow after his age. So this is how they try to tell these things. So that is where it comes from. It comes from astrology. Then what exactly is the New Age movement? Well, again, it's very hard to get a definition, but uh, there was a couple of uh, books. Uh, the first book that I read which really introduced me to the New Age movement was The Seduction of Christianity, uh, written by an American Christian called Dave Hunt. Uh, and Dave wrote in the introduction to that book, he said this, the church needs to recognize that cults are only part of a much larger and more seductive deception known as the New Age movement. This is a broad coalition of networking groups all working for world unity based upon religious experiences and beliefs that have their roots in Eastern mysticism. So it has religion at its heart. It is a spiritual uh, movement. It's seeking to unite people, and a lot of their philosophy is based on Eastern mysticism and Eastern religion and so on. Uh, some years ago, I was in London. Uh, I was walking through a railway station, and I got handed a free copy of this. Now, I don't know why the guy gave it to me, because it's called Girl About Town. I think he must have wanted rid of his allocation, so he gave me a copy. But it was interesting because there was a, an article, Spirit of the Times, it was all to do with the New Age movement, and part of that article says this, New Age is used to denote a whole range of interests, including health and well-being, the many forms of therapy or self-help, a concern for the rest of humanity and the environment, and respect for nature and feminine wisdom. A forming principle behind the New Age is the belief that we are actually an integral part of the Earth and the cosmos, not in charge of it. In other words, that everything in the universe is linked together, that man does not have dominion over the planet, if you like, but we're simply uh, a connected unit to everything that exists. That is part of Eastern religious philosophy, and I'll mention more of that later on. So those are some thoughts about what it is. How does the uh, New Age describe itself? Well, let me quote from a New Age newspaper, and this gives you a good idea as to how they view the New Age movement. We depart the age of Pisces and enter the more enlightened, caring, sharing age of Aquarius with its freedom of spiritual choice. New Agers drop dogma, they dislike materialism, and they yearn for first-hand spiritual experiences. They differentiate themselves from evangelical born-again Christians in that guilt and repentance are not featured. They ascribe human afflictions to internal imbalance, wrong thinking, or the law of karma. So all the problems in the world are put down to internal imbalance, and I'll have more to say about that, wrong thinking, or the law of karma, and I'll have more to say about that. There's no mention of sin. Guilt, repentance are out as far as New Agers are concerned. They don't take those things into their thinking. <clears throat> they believe that as the age of Aquarius dawns, there are new spiritual energies being focused upon planet Earth. 
And that's why, in many cases, they have adopted the sign of the rainbow to symbolize these spiritual energies which are being focused upon planet Earth. So that is the what it is. We've seen where it comes from, what it is. Then the other question that I might ask is, how does the New Age movement hope to achieve its aims? This vision of a world spiritual unity based upon Eastern religious philosophies, etc. Well, when you understand who's at the back of the New Age movement, it's not terribly difficult to discern how the strategy is being put into practice. The one who's at the back of the New Age movement is Satan himself, the one that we read about in the Garden of Eden. And today he's using the same tactics as he used back in the Garden of Eden. Well, what were the tactics he used? Well, he told lies. He's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. He's been a liar from the beginning. And in the Garden of Eden, he told three lies. And those three lies are as relevant today as they were then because they are at the heart of much that passes for New Age philosophy. The first lie he said was, ye shall not surely die. Second lie, he said, was ye shall be as gods. And the third lie could be summarized, ignore what this person who claims to be God has told you, do what I tell you, and you will get hidden power and hidden knowledge. Just go through a little initiation ceremony, just eat that piece of fruit, and you'll be on the same level as this person who claims to be God, and you will have the right to make decisions as to what is right and what is wrong. Those three lies are at the heart of much of New Age thinking today. Before my conversion, uh, back in 1984, I was very involved in sport. I played a lot of hockey and I played a lot of cricket. Now, not only did I like the sport, sadly, and to my shame, I enjoyed the social life. And I knocked about with a crowd of guys who were very much into the socializing after the sport. And we would sit many a time in this bar or that bar, and we would start off with beers or whatever it happened to be. But then as the evening progressed, we were very fond of cocktails. And we would concoct our own cocktails. And a cocktail would be a measure of this and a measure of that and maybe a double measure of this and a, a bottle of mixers or something. And the whole thing would be shaken up together and we would consume that. And friends, when it comes to New Age philosophy, that's what the devil's doing. He's giving a dash of this and a dash of that. You're getting a, a dash of Hinduism. You're getting a dash of mysticism. You're getting a dash of paganism. You're getting a dash of occultism. You're getting a dash of Taoism, which is Chinese philosophy. You're getting a dash of Gnosticism, which was an early heresy that nearly wrecked the church. And all of these things are being fed into a spiritual cup and people are being asked to partake of it today. And man, being by nature a spiritual person, is willing to partake of this cup. Now let's have a look at how some of these philosophies are being foisted upon people today. The first lie, ye shall not surely die. Well, we need to understand, the Bible makes it plain that death is followed by judgment. It's appointed on the man once to die. In John's Gospel, the Lord had raised up a crippled man, and the people were standing wide-eyed in amazement. And he said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in, to which all that are in the grave shall, uh, shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Some unto the resurrection of eternal life, some unto the resurrection of eternal damnation. The Lord, and in the Bible, makes it plain, death followed by judgment. But what is the lie that's being filtered around today? People are being told, death is simply the doorway to another life. Uh, it used to be that only out in the Far East or something like that would you get people believing in reincarnation. The idea that when you die, your soul leaves the body and then comes to inhabit another body back on Earth. But friends, in our Western world, the belief in reincarnation is very high indeed. Uh, about 50% of Americans will believe in reincarnation, and many people in Europe also. And this is because, of course, in the last 30 or more years, uh, the gurus of the various Eastern religions, they're no longer out there. They've come over to the West, and uh, they are here, and they're over in America, and so on, and they are putting their religious philosophy forth. So that's what you're finding today. It's interesting to see some of the people who are promoting this lie of the devil. Uh, Michael Aspel uh, had a chat show on TV a few years ago, and he brought a guest on, and he said, now, this lady in previous lives uh, was a Roman soldier and an Inca princess, but today she is the movie star, singer, dancer, actress, Shirley MacLaine. 
And on came Shirley MacLaine, and Shirley MacLaine is viewed by many as the high priestess of the New Age movement. She has written several books, one called Out on a Limb and the other called Dancing in the Light. Uh, Out on a Limb was made into a mini TV series some years ago and broadcast over two Wednesday evenings, about four hours of broadcasting altogether. And as you watch this, you could glean her New Age philosophy coming through. And she made it plain that her view is we have all lived before there is no death, simply reincarnation. So you find Shirley MacLaine putting her lie, this lie of the devil across. Even on local TV some years ago on Jerry Kelly's program one Friday evening, there was another American singer called Diane Solomon come on. Now, she was interviewed and she said that under hypnosis, and mark that, under hypnosis, she was regressed into five or six previous lives. And one of them she claimed to have been a man living in America going across a field to buy sugar for his wife's birthday. She also claimed to be a Christian, but with the edges rubbed off. She was open to other religious philosophies. So there you had the lie of the devil going out on local TV. Not only in the field of entertainment, but in the field of education, we need to be careful. Uh, some years ago, uh, this magazine was given out to six farmers in various schools around the province. It was produced by the TSB. And in it, there were two full pages all about the New Age movement. And it made reference to terms which are linked to the teaching of reincarnation. Uh, we actually contacted Roy McGee, who was then in Dundonald Presbyterian Church, because it was a girl from Dundonald School who had given us this. He got in touch with the TSB, and they said, oh, sorry about that. Uh, we didn't actually know what was in our magazine. We'd given a franchise out to a marketing firm to, to put this thing together. So in the light of what you've told us, we'll withdraw it. But of course, by that stage, it was already in the hands of the young people. But there you had this all about uh, various aspects of New Age, including reincarnation. Down in Hollywood, you have a school named after a man called Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner was into the occult in a big way. He claimed to have a spirit guide. Uh, he believed fervently in reincarnation. Uh, he used to belong to the uh, Theosophical Society, which he then left and formed the Anthro Anthroposophical Society. It's not easy to say those words. But he firmly believed in these things, and the literature linked to the school says it's founded on the underlying principles of Rudolf Steiner. So they are open to lots of strange religious philosophies within that particular group. You get many things promoting reincarnation. These religions are no longer out in India. They're in the heart of Belfast. Uh, if you look at the Saturday Night uh, Telegraph, What's On Tomorrow, you'll find meditation 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the Lisburn Road. It's actually held in Peace House. Uh, and that's where the Buddhists meet to um and to chant. And of course, they believe in reincarnation. The Hare Krishnas, I'm sure many of you, like myself, have been stopped in somewhere like Corn Market. And the guy with his head almost shaved will uh, stop you and give you a book and then try to extract money from you. And I'll be saying much more about them on Thursday night. But they believe in reincarnation. Uh, Buddhists, by the way, have some leading personalities in their ranks. Uh, Richard Gere, the actor. Patrick Duffy, who was Bobby Ewing, I think, in Dallas or something like that. Uh, these are Buddhist. Tina Turner is a Buddhist. Uh, within the Hare Krishnas, Haley Mills, the actress daughter of Sir John Mills, is a Hare Krishna. Uh, Boy George was for a period of time a uh, Hare Krishna. I'm not sure if he's still there or not. If so, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure. His lifestyle seems terribly bad, so I don't even think the Hare Krishnas would tolerate his behavior. Within politics, we've just had a general election. Uh, the Natural Law Party. Uh, they believe in reincarnation because they are basically a front for transcendental meditation, uh, which was founded by the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, uh, who, of course, was very close to the Beatles. Uh, George Harrison of the Beatles, of course, is a, a well-known Hare Krishna, uh, and he gave a, a manor in England to them, supposedly for sort of like a, a college, but it's been turned into like a temple, and there's been great debates uh, and arguments between the local council and planning authorities because every so often about 40,000 Hare Krishna devotees descend upon this little English village and they jam up on all the roads leading to it and so on to have their various festivals and so on. 
there is a movement known as the Grail Movement, uh, which would meet from time to time in Maysfield Leisure Centre. It teaches reincarnation. Uh, there's a secret society known as the Rosicrucians, and they believe in reincarnation. Uh, there's a religious group known as Scientology, which has people like John Travolta, uh, uh, Nicole Kidman, and Tom Cruise in its ranks. They believe in reincarnation as well. And of course, these people who are in the public spotlight, a lot of young people are influenced by them. And well, if it's okay for John Travolta, well, why not for me also? So today, this lie of the devil, ye shall not surely die, reincarnation, it is alive and it is well today. Now, I will have, we'll have more to say about reincarnation later when uh, I show you the video uh, of the interview with uh, Glenn Hoddle. But we'll move on from that first lie of the devil. And the second lie was this, ye shall be as gods. That magazine that was given out to pupils in the TSB, it, it mentioned a man called Sir George Trevelyan, who was described in the magazine as the sort of godfather of the British New Age. And some years ago on Channel 4 TV, they did a series on the New Age movement. They also did another series just last year called Desperately Seeking Something. Uh, and this was a chart you could send away for. Uh, you phoned up a number and asked them to send you this chart, and they uh, added two pound, I think it was, to your telephone bill. And this gave you the details of all the places that were featured in that series. So if anybody's interested, uh, you can have a wee look uh, at all the different places that were featured on the New Age program. But as I say, several years earlier, Sir George Trevelyan appeared on another program, and this is what he said about the meaning of life, if you like. The whole meaning of the experiment on man, of man on earth is to develop a creature who can in time come back to God as a co-creator. Are we worthy to become a co-creator with the creator, with God? That's the great human destiny and the great purpose of planet earth now coming to fulfillment. So here you have a man teaching that our purpose in life is to become co-creators with the creator. Well, you know... God has given man dominion over the earth and he has entrusted its resources into our hands and we have done some very good things. There's one thing man has never been able to do. He's never been able to create something out of nothing. That is exactly what God did when he created this whole universe. Hebrews 11 verse 3 says, The worlds were framed by the word of God. Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God did not need pre-existent material when he created this whole universe. He simply spoke and it came into being. Now this man, Sir George Trevelyan, thinks that we can become co-creators. It's a bit like Isaiah 14 and 14 where someone said, you know, I will, be like the mo I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now that was an earthly king, but we also believe it's a picture of Satan's fall where he had aspirations to be on the same level as God Almighty. Man, if he ever creates something out of nothing, will have the right to be a co-creator. But you and I know that that day will never come. These people believe that not only are we uh, on the same level as the divine, but they actually believe that the divine automatically is within us. Uh, there is a philosophy known as pantheism which teaches that everything that exists constitutes God. There's another philosophy known as panentheism which teaches that God is in everything. In other words, uh, you know, the likes of Hinduism would teach there's no difference between a, a poodle, a pickle, a person or a plum, if you like. You know, God is everything and everything is God. There was an ecologist who was interviewed on the Channel 4 TV series a few years ago. He was from Northern Ireland, we could tell that by his accent. And this is what he had to say. He said, for me the important thing about the New Age is the recognition that the presence of God is in each one of us, rather than an external figure somewhere in the sky, that actually we are divine beings. That was what that man said. Within professing Christendom, there's a very popular American called Tony Campolo. I want you to listen what he said. We want to convince the whole human race that there is a God who established the infinite value of every person, who mystically dwells in each person. I do not mean that others represent Jesus for us. I mean that Jesus actually is present in each other person. That's from a leading so-called Christian. My friends, that is heresy. 
Because of the fall of Adam, you and I are born in a state of alienation from God. Spiritually, we are dead in trespasses and in sins. God does not dwell within us. The only time God comes to dwell within us is when we are born again, born from above. And then our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ promised that he and the Father would come and make their abode with those who become his children through faith in Christ. To suggest that God is automatically within us, that we are divine beings, is heresy. And as I say, obviously it surfaces, sadly, even within professing Christendom. Shirley MacLaine wrote in her book, The tragedy of the human race was that we had forgotten we were each divine. We ha- our problem is we've forgotten that we're actually in the God class. Uh, there's a New Age magazine called Network. It's produced down uh, in Kalinchi, uh, and uh, I used to get it. I haven't got it for some time now. Uh, but they had an article uh, which uh, said this. It said, The only difference between you and God is that God knows that he is God. You have simply forgotten This is our problem. According to these people, we have forgotten that we're divine beings. Uh, The Church of Scientology teaches basically the same thing, that we have descended from a race of gods known as Thetans, uh, and we have forgotten that we are gods, and we need to get back into that state of mind. You might remember the guy who used to be a sports commentator, and then he joined the Green Party, uh, and then he turned up in a turquoise tracksuit, and he declared that he was the son of God. Uh, That was David Icke. Well, this is a New Age newspaper, and there's a photograph of David Icke. uh, And in this he says, you are God, I am God, we are all God. This is the sort of talk that is going around today. (coughs) Rob Zins, who spoke here last September, Uh, He gave me a copy of a a thing that he came across in a doctor's waiting room in Vermont where he was waiting to see the doctor. Uh, And people were encouraged to read this to give them a bit of a lift before they went in to see the doctor. This is what some of it said. I am a powerful, positive individual and all events in this day are for my highest good. What I am is beautiful and I pull to me this day only beauty and refreshment. What I am is eternal, immortal, universal, and infinite. I see only beauty and strength every moment of my life. What I am is infinite. I do not judge the evolution of others. What they are right now is for their highest good. Each action I take this day is an expression of the God force. Therefore, each action I take is a part of my infinite creativity. There is no real sin, only energy. I follow the energy of my highest evolution at all times, and so be it. I am open at all times to communication from my inner self, and that communication leads me to my highest evolution. Basically, what this is saying is that the journey to the true self is found by looking within yourself to to find the divine uh, that resides within you. In uh, Northern Ireland in recent years, The government has been spending a lot of money on training courses organized by a group called the Pacific Institute. And I was given a copy of the manual and a copy of tapes, and I want to read to you uh, just what these people teach. The heading is Affirmations and Visualization. Deciding to make a change in a habit, attitude, or personal situation will not bring about that change. The decision is only the first step. Further action is required to make the change, first in our subconscious self-image and then in reality. Our goal is the mental picture of what we want. When this goal is written down to be used in programming our subconscious, it becomes an affirmation. Remember, an affirmation is a statement of fact or belief written out in a positive present tense form as though the goal was already accomplished. By the very act of writing out our affirmations, we have already begun to move them into external reality. Moreover, writing gives them a precision they will never have if they remain only in our mind. Written affirmations are a useful indicator of our process of change. Do you realize what this is saying? That if you want things to change, it's not enough to think about what you would like to change. You have to write it down. That becomes an affirmation. You then have to visualize it, which is an occultic technique. You have to visualize this change actually taking place. And hey, presto, it's going to take place. 
This is mysticism. This is occultism. And the government is spending hundreds of thousands of pounds to tell people. It's no wonder that certain Christians that I know have refused to go on with this course when they see what's being taught. This is, as I say, an open doorway into the occult. And our taxes are being used by the government to train people in this. I have another training course that a, a chap from Brethren Circles gave me. He said, I was supposed to teach this, and I handed it back to him. I said, I can't, because it teaches that man is basically good. Uh, we are naturally loving and cooperative. Well, oh, that's rich in Northern Ireland, <laughs> when you think about it. The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. There's none righteous, there's none that doeth good, until man realizes what a wicked, depraved person he is. There is no hope for him. But these people are telling us, we're wonderful people. We can change things. We can create our, create our own reality by using the power of the mind by speaking it forth. And I want to tell you, in so-called Christendom, the same techniques are taught. There's what they call the health and wealth gospel, the word of faith movement. People like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Benny Hinn, Frederick Price, all the people who are featuring on so-called Euro-Christian TV channel, these people teach exactly the same thing. They say that words are containers for faith, and when we speak things as if they are already in force, they will come about. They say that God is bound by spiritual laws. They say that God had to exercise his faith by speaking the world into existence. What a ludicrous idea to suggest that God needed faith. Because that suggests that there's something more powerful than God because your faith must be focused on someone or something. So to suggest God had faith is a nonsense. But these people teach it. I could say a lot more about Kenneth Copeland than Kenneth Hagen, but that would, that would take me off on another tangent that we'll be here at about 10 o'clock or more tomorrow morning. But there we are. Uh, that's the sort of thing that is happening today. So, as I say, uh, this idea of ye shall be as God, Kenneth Copeland, one example, I get his magazine sent to me every month, it's free, uh, but it means that I can be kept up to date. He told about the disciples and they're out in the Sea of Galilee, and the, uh, the Savior is sleeping in the boat, and the storm blows up, and they panic, and they wake him up and says, peace be still. He said, those disciples, if they had only but known it, they could have stood up, and they could have said, peace be still. What nonsense believe that we have control of the elements. But these people teach that we are in the God class. I have an audio tape of Kenneth Copeland and he says this about born again believers. He says you don't have a God in you, you are one. Kenneth Hagin said this, every born again believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus Christ. That's heresy. Only someone who pre-existed can incarnate. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. You and I, if we're here tonight and we are children of God, we're not products of incarnation. We are, by the grace of God, products of regeneration, new birth, which is a totally different thing. But these people, you can go into the bookstore of knowledge, and that brings us to the world of the occult, which I've already made reference to. And today, this world is obsessed with the occult. Uh, all forms are being foisted upon people today. Some people have been told it's only harmless fun, not do a bit but no harm. The word of God is quite explicit now, on these things. They are an abomination in his sight and we are to take nothing to do with it. I've already mentioned astrology. From we get up in the morning to we go to bed at night, whether it's on breakfast TV or Anne and Nick, morning newspapers, Belfast Telegraph, whatever it happens to be, horoscopes, you know, astrology is foisted upon us as harmless fun. You can't turn on the lottery and there's old mystic Meg giving her predictions and so on. And it was interesting, I'm trying to remember, I think it was some sports program was on some months ago and it was giving details of the mother of Victor, St Victor Stallone, Sylvester Stallone, Sylvester Stallone who played Rocky 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. His mother is an astrologer. She has gone to Russia and she gave astrological readings for the Gorbachevs and for Boris Yeltsin. What a frightening thought to think that the men with their fingers on the buttons of destruction are listening to what the stargazers are saying. We could have all ended up in a mushroom cloud if the stars had been in the wrong place. But that's the sort of thing that's happening. Uh, Diana, Princess of Wales, who's one of her closest confidants? A lady called Penny Thornton, known as the Royal Astrologer. She used to write the horoscopes for the Today newspaper before it got closed down. 
I don't know if she saw it coming or not, but it closed down anyhow. But that's the sort of thing that is happening in our world today. I'm going to break here and show you just about three or four minutes of video. I mentioned that there was this astrology program on, on Sunday night on the Everyman series. I want to so-called Christian minister visualizing a Jesus who appears to her. She offers her astrology to this Jesus and says, if it's not right, take it away. And this Jesus gives it back to her, and it's beautiful. My friends, this is the occult. That is a demonic deception. Satan is transformed into an angel of light, we are told. And that's exactly what is happening to this lady. Yet that is going out on national TV. And people, are, people are being told, the man who's beforehand, he says, the church has problem with non-Christian astrologers, not with Christian astrologers. Friends, astrology is, in biblical terms, divination. In the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, the Lord lists a whole lot of practices which the children of Israel are going to encounter in the promised land. And he says, take nothing to do with them. He says, they are an abomination to me, and those that practice them are an abomination. There is no way that you can sanctify what God has abominated. Yet this is exactly what these people are trying to do. So lots of forms of fortune telling, apart from astrology, you have palmistry, tarot cards, lots of these things. You go to the seaside, they're available to you. Down in Newcastle, there's a sandwich board out inviting you to come in to see Lynn, who will read your palm. And on our sandwich board, it says, as seen on Kelly. Uh, well, that wouldn't surprise me because Jerry Kelly's program is a haven for everything occultic over the years. He's had one occultic practice after another. And friends, I want to tell you too, the so-called Toronto blessing that invaded our land back in 1994 was a modern form of Gnosticism, which brings you into the occultic realm, where you go into a mind-altered state and you are told this is how you really encounter God through this sort of spiritual experience. It's not enough just to have faith in Christ and to rely on his word. You've got to have first-hand spiritual experiences. That's exactly what the New Age newspaper said. People yearn for this sort of thing. And my friends, the, new, the Toronto blessing was nothing more than Gnosticism revived in modern garb. And uh, it used techniques which are common in Hinduism. This idea of people coming up to the front and the, the white guru as he is now, he touches you on the forehead and down you go. That's a form uh, uh, known in Hinduism as the Shakti Pat. There's a book on the bookstall called Death of a Guru. It's the testimony of a former Hindu guru who became a Christian, Rabbi Maharaj. And he talks about the power that he had to zap people. And this is an occultic power. And that's exactly what's happening to people at these meetings. These people are being told, when you come into the meeting, empty your mind. You know, in Eastern meditation is where you empty your mind, not where you fill it with the Word of God, but empty it. They're trying to achieve what's known as clear mind. Now, the people who drew up the advert for 7-Up uh, knew exactly what the buzzwords are. They said it's cool to be clear. Now, you probably think that's because it's clear liquid. Well, there is that aspect. But it's also referring to clear mind because that's what people who meditate Eastern style are seeking to achieve because it's only in that state of an altered consciousness can you have a spiritual experience. And that's what people have been told at Toronto style meetings. Now that Toronto has waned away, the latest place to go to is Pensacola in Florida. Apparently since August 1995, revival has broken out in Pensacola. It's different from Toronto, they tell us. Well, I've watched the videos and there's nothing different about it. Uh, it's the same uh, Christ defaming. It's, it's a blasphemy. And how anybody could believe that it's of God. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to reveal truth to us and to glorify Christ. And these things do neither of those things at all. It's terrible days we live in. But the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter days some shall depart from the faith and shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And it's all part of New Age. That's really what it comes down to. Another aspect of New Age is in the realm of uh, health. You, we are being encouraged today to get into alternative health uh, remedies and all that type of thing. And uh, I'll get the book. Yep. You've maybe seen this symbol here today. Now, this relates to several alternative therapies 
in particular acupuncture and reflexology. But the common thread to a lot of these practices is energy. That there is an energy which must be balanced, and if it's balanced, then you're in good health. Remember I talked, I quoted from the New Age newspaper, sickness and all that sort of thing is due to various factors, and one of them was internal imbalance. Well, these philosophies, and this is where the Taoism, the Chinese philosophy comes in, they would teach that there is a universal life energy known as qi or kai flowing through the universe and everything in the universe, and it goes in cycles. And as long as the flow is not interrupted, then everything works perfectly and you're in good health and all the rest of it. But if you get a blockage in the system, and in this life energy, by the way, is, it has two dimensions, two aspects to it. There's the male and the female, the dark and the light side. They're known as yin and yang. And as long as your yin and your yang are in balance, then you're in good health. But if you get a blockage in the system and you have too much yin and not enough yang, well, then you get sick. And this is where you call in the practitioner, and he either releases the blockage by inserting the little needles or massaging the soles of your feet or whatever it happens to be. And we're told this is how you correct everything. I have a book here, Alternative Medicine. Now, this is a secular book. It's not a Christian book. But listen to what the writer writes in the foreword to it. He says, as we look more deeply into the structure of man, we find that he can be reduced in physical terms to a collection of fields. What controls all these fields of energy at any one time? Science has no answers, but I maintain that the controlling forces are in the unseen or supersensible world. There is a superior controlling force that some call God that seems to make it work altogether harmoniously for most of the time. It is this superior controlling force that many alternative medical therapies harness to cure the patient. So these people claim that they're harnessing an energy which some call God to cure the patient. There was a, a home finder uh, supplement of the Telegraph last week and there was an article all about Feng Shui. Feng Shui will change your life if you let it. Change your life with Feng Shui explains this ancient philosophy and shows how it might improve your well-being. The Chinese believe that an energy known as Qi flows around us throughout life. As long as it flows freely, the body will remain healthy and good luck will be attracted. If this energy becomes stagnant or blocked, then life takes a turn for the worse, according to the authors. To ensure the benefits of free-flowing chai in your life, it is essential that you facilitate the movement of chai in the building in which you live and work. And it goes on to tell you what to do in your house to make sure that the chai... And this releases the serpent power. This chart tells you what ar uh, aromatic oils or what crystals you could put on your body to influence the chakra system. You see, aromatherapy and the use of crystals believes that it goes beyond the physical, it's going into the spiritual realm. And this is all part of New Age. So these things are going around today. Uh, martial arts. You know, somebody puts seven roof tiles down and they headbutt them and they break them. That's not natural. Therefore it has to be supernatural. They're conjuring up energy from an unknown source. When they come to fight, they bow to the holy ground on which they are going to fight. You will find that as you go into martial arts, as you go into yoga, which no Christian should go into, that you will get more and more away from the physical and more and more into mind control. Yoga, unfortunately, is being foisted upon the medical world today. Uh, my wife, uh, who was here last night, is a practice nurse. Uh, she did a course in asthma, and she gets a magazine, Asthma News, and there on the front is the Lotus position, and it's all to do with breathe life into 1997. And yoga teaches that you can control your breathing, which controls what's known as prana, which is the life energy. There's a form of yoga known as pranayama yoga, which is all to do with breathing techniques, and this believes it can cure your problems, but it believes that prana is the life force. This is a, a nursing magazine, the Nursing Standard. Uh, Meditation is what you need. It's all about yoga. And this is what the, the article has the honesty to say. Yoga practice has a clear overall aim to gain mental stability and appreciation that our individual souls and that of the universe are one and the same. You see, Hinduism teaches that 
everything is one. That's monism. And everything is God. And our individual soul is part of the great impersonal soul. And to have a, a, a real experience, you clear your mind and you realize that you're at one with the rest of the universe. Uh, it's an experience known as samadhi. And you can do it through yoga, you can do it through transcendental meditation, you can do it through various techniques. These alternative healing therapies, uh, a practitioner uh, of aromatherapy said this, is a lady called Mary Grant from Belfast. Early on I thought I could offer aromatherapy on a health and relaxation basis. Now I realize that every consultation contains some implied question about the journey to the true self. That's not physical, this is spiritual. This is helping you to discover the, the answer to life. These things are all part of New Age. Even in the uh, area of uh, ecology and preservation, down at Ross Trevor, there's the Kilbrony Ross Trevor Preservation Group, and they take school parties down there. And I was given the training manual uh, that they use. Uh, and the training manual, if I can find what I'm looking for here, uh, is all full of New Age thinking and philosophy. Uh, here's part of what it says. This is called the Earth Keeper's Manual. And this is given to six and seven year olds. It encourages them to go to a magic spot. A magic spot is a special place where you can be alone for a short time, a place where magical things can happen. It is a place where you can enjoy some quiet time in touch with other life. This isn't given to young people. It then says, every plant and every animal is related to every other living and non-living thing on the earth. That's Hindu philosophy, monism, everything is connected to each other. Materials that cycle are used over and over again. Together the energy and materials connect all the things on the earth in a giant web of life. You very often see a symbol like a giant spider's web. That's the new age that everything is interconnected. Everything is made up of the same basic building materials. These specks of materials have been around a long time and are used over and over again by all living things. That's recycling, reincarnation. That's what's coming through uh, in this whole thing. All living things need energy to grow, to move, to do anything. Energy is the spark of life. This has been given to six and seven year olds. It was a Christian parent who was on the board of governors of the school who was very concerned about this. So you just never know when you're going to come across new age thinking and so on. Now, I don't know whether, I have brought a 15 minute video with me. Uh, would you all be willing to, this is the Glenn Hoddle interview. Uh, is it okay if I go ahead and show this? Uh, I think it's important that you, if you believe that Glenn Hoddle is a Christian, I would encourage you to stay and watch this video because I'll post just very briefly. Glenn Ottle, by his own admission, is not a born again Christian. He stated that clearly. His testimony is that he had a, a real exciting feeling when he went to the birthplace of Christ. There was no mention of conviction of sin, conversion to Christ. He came back and he studied not just the Bible, but the books of other Eastern religious philosophies. And it's obvious that he has, you know, it's a sort of pick and mix match that he has got. He's got a bit of this and a bit of that and so on. He talked about the planet as a living being. You know, well, that's out of Greek mythology, the worship of Mother Earth, uh, the Greek goddess Gaia and so on. Uh, he talked about earthquakes. If, if we were all spiritual beings, there wouldn't be any such thing as earthquakes. Well, not only uh, was man put into a thing, Adam sinned, but the whole creation came under a curse, and the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain, awaiting redemption. Uh, the reason that our world has these catastrophes is because the world is in a fallen state and under God's curse, just as man fell as well. Uh, then we had, of course, death. Do you have any fear of death? No, this is just an overcoat, and I will have more to say about that on Thursday night if you're here when I'm talking about the Hare Krishnas. And he immediately was then asked, do you believe in reincarnation? He said, yes, I believe I've lived before. What? I don't know. And he went on to explain the law of karma by saying about the future is more important. What we're having to face today is a result of our past, i.e. previous lives. And I'll have more to say about that on Thursday. I feel very sorry for Glenn Hoddle because he was held up as a Christian. 
the organization Christians in Sport for years promoted Hoddle the video. I don't know whether they still do or not. I hope in the light of that interview that they have realized that this man is not saved. And uh, it's, uh, it's a tragedy. It would be lovely if someone in his position was. But he's not. He, he thinks Christ is merely an example of how we should live. He has no concept of the saving work of Christ. Where Christ lived the sinless life that you and I can never live, he has established a perfect righteousness. He's the end of the law for righteousness, i.e. he has fulfilled all the requirements of God's law and established the very righteousness of God. And having done that, he has then gone to the cross to suffer as our substitute, pay the punishment for our sins. And when we trust Christ, our sins go to him. And that perfect righteousness which he has established is put upon us. What a wonderful Savior we have. How tragic that Glenn Hoddle knows nothing of that Savior. Our time is long, long gone. I want to thank you for your patience. I think I can assure you that uh, we will not go uh, as long on other nights, but tonight was a very full subject to look at, and I hope that you find it helpful indeed. I think we'll dispense with our closing hymn, and we'll just commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer now.